this session is going to be a lot about the future of TV. Um, but let's start from the very beginning. Uh, when and when did Black Mirror come about? How did the, did, did the idea develop? Uh, it was, we'd just done Dead Set, which was a, we did, can you hear me? Just wanted a human <laughs> contact. Um, uh, we, uh, I don't know why I said that. Um, we'd just done Dead Set, which was a show, uh, like zombie uh, epic uh, for Channel 4, and they said, have you got any other ideas? And uh, like, I'd always wanted to do a show that was Tales of the Unexpected-esque or Twilight Zone-esque, um, and we discussed it, and then we discussed it with Channel 4. It was originally going to be eight half hours written by lots of different people. Mm -hmm. I think that's fair to say. And the technology yeah. aspect came in sort of relatively late, didn't it? Although it was always there, it was a sort of a modern day Twilight Zone. So talking about modern themes, I think technology was always, go always going to be one of them. But then I think when we started to explore it, you sort of, oh my God, there's so many things here that feel influenced or, you know, uh, things have changed so dramatically through technology. We should sort of embrace that a little bit more. Mm. Yeah, I, and I, I, re I remember at the time, because I'd been looking up, the, I'd been reading a lot about the Twilight Zone and Rod Serling, who... who uh, created that and wrote most of the episodes, and he was he was, uh, you know, he was influenced by things that were going on in society at the time. And I remember thinking, well, what would we be talking about now? And one of the things was like terrorism and things like that. And um, and at the time, there were lots of sort of adverts for Apple products that were full of people having a really happy time. And as soon as I see anything like that, I get really fucking suspicious and scared, <laughs> because if you, I don't know if you've seen Soylent Green. Which is, have you seen Soylent Green? It's a very good film. Um, but there's a bit in it where an old guy goes to be uh, euthanized and turn in, uh, turned into food, which is a spoiler, sorry. Um, and just before, uh, they, they take him into a place and they show him a, a film of, of beautiful things happening in nature and it's all very happy and then he gets uh, killed and eaten. Um, and uh, Apple adverts reminded me of that film. <laughs> um, and so I thought that's a good, there's a good vein to mine. Can you mine a vein? So, are you saying terrorism doesn't scare you? Well, but yeah, nothing else scares you, but, yeah, but, but an you Apple ad for a phone. 24 had <laughs> okay. sort of cornered the market in terrorism, hadn't they? Oh, okay. So, yeah. you know, that had been done. Whereas that would require too much discipline. So being we're not spooked do that. by the App Store, that hadn't been okay. done. Great. So, yeah. But making an anthology, I guess, I mean, to me, it just seems so overwhelming because you're not just making a normal conventional series, you're making essentially separate films at the same time. Yeah, and it's stupid, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. also for Channel 4 back then, you know, it's quite hard for them to market in terms of, you know, trying to show people what the show is really going to be like if, if, if there's an ongoing theme, but they're all quite different. W w was that a concern to you back then? Uh, we were blissfully ignorant at that point. Um, I know, I mean, we found it difficult to sort of describe what the show was going to be because you can say this is a modern Twilight Zone and this is a show and it's going to you know, address technology in the modern world. But until you, until you start having films and stories, you sort of are, you know, it's unknown. So they didn't quite know what it was and we didn't quite know what it was. And I suppose it's taken us to this point where we've got a, got a stronger sense now of what we're trying to do with Black Mirror and how, you know, wide ranging in terms of genres and tones it can embrace. So, yeah, I mean, it's hard to market something when it's in its infancy, but particularly in anthology, yeah. Well, and the very first episode was was advertised um, as a as a straight thriller, like as a straight political thriller. I thought the you were going to say as a rom-com. <laughs> <laughs> that was in the yeah no, it turned out to be the erotic drama of the year. Um, but it, no, it was it was it was advertised very much as a straight. I think they even ran adverts in the cinema or something like that that made it look like it was a. Uh, it was going to be about terrorism and about somebody yeah. um, kidnapping a princess. So, but it was, it's a very difficult show to bring people to tune into on a weekly basis. So, so it was, it was, that was one of the things we noticed immediately when we went to Netflix. That makes much more sense as a place for anthology shows because you don't have, uh, you're not beholden to ratings on, mm. a, on a weekly basis. So how, I mean... Describe how you come up with the ideas from from you know when it's sort of like an acorn to when it becomes the overall process. Do you sort of is it from a conversation you have between you two about how you know what haven't you done before? Is it is 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 it something that you sort of you know have a, have a concept and then you knock it down the road and then maybe return to it later? 
I like that knocking it down the road thing. <laughs> I like that. It, I mean, they vary, don't they? It's yeah. uh, all the genesis of them are, are all very different. It, it sometimes it's sometimes it's genuinely we're just having a conversation and an idea just like I'll, I'll suddenly start going hoo, 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 um, like a fit, like yeah. a yeah. And you you I and notice I'm happy. you never call for medical assistance no. when that happens. You just sit there rubbing your hands, hoping that I'm having a <laughs> seizure, um, and. Um, <laughs> and um, and then, or some, sometimes it's like, quite often there's two ideas that have been knocking around and they collide. So there was one, San Junipero was one of those, where there were sort of two separate ideas that we'd been kind of worrying away at and couldn't quite, quite often that's the other thing, is quite often you go, I know that I've had this idea, I can't quite work out how to make it work. And suddenly you think of a, a, what you should do that would be a better thing to do. Like White Bear was a good example of that, where it was a very different story, and then suddenly this other thing suggested itself. And then sometimes we go, what haven't we done? Um, we haven't done a musical, or we haven't done a... We keep we keep going, oh, we haven't done a Western, and then we go, oh, fucking Westworld. Please tell me you're, gonna, well, you're <laughs> going to do a musical, that would be brilliant. <laughs> well, I, well you, know, you, you never know. You never know, um, but um, we'll, we we discuss genres we haven't done. Uh, Hated in the Nation was one where we went. We haven't done a detective story, for instance. So sometimes that is a useful way of going. What's the Black Mirror version of a haunted house story? What's the Black Mirror version of a, a period drama and things like that? And that often kicks up a lot of ideas. Yes, but it's as you say, it's often all these thoughts at the same time, and hopefully they all collide into one because, you know. Yes, you could do a you know a genre we haven't done, but unless you've got something interesting or thematically new to say, you shouldn't mm. be doing it. Which so. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> and then when you write it, I mean, what's the the process then? Is it kind of like you write a script, so then you have a feedback session? Is that how 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 does that develop? First, we discuss the story. I mean, now I'm much more disciplined than I was. I used to be one of those people who was like, I can't plan anything. I just write the script. I'll just write it. That's the only way. I, what an idiot. I was, basically, because I'd end up having to rewrite the entire script. I mean, I still do, but at least I'm now deluded into thinking I'm following a plan from the start. <laughs> so, I'll, so we'll come up with a whole, like, I'll sort of come, I'll go off and write up the story over, like, probably about three, four pages, depending, sometimes longer. Mm -hmm. Then we'll discuss it. Then we send that off to Netflix. Then we discuss it again with them. Then I start writing the script. So now it's a lot more, uh, and then I'll start changing it and apologising. <laughs> Um, yeah. No, it depends, isn't it? It depends mm. on... And some of the episodes have taken years and some have taken weeks to yeah. develop, you know. Sometimes, you know, where you can spend months in a in a room breaking the story and try... You know, sometimes something like Hated in the Nation, the, the one Charles just referred to, you know, it's incredibly complex and lots of things going on and you're trying to follow a, you know, um, procedural, but at the same time, there's so many different themes going on and plot points and all of that, you know, often the, the skill is in trying to streamline... Mm and to strip out ideas and just to hold on to the core elements. And that's, I think, can take the longest time. It's is that why you were always telling me to cut bits out? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, often, often that's, well, that's what happens, is that we sort of sit there and discuss things, and you're, you're quite a fierce critic of every idea I have. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, in a good way, in a way that's like... Like, you, you'll sort of go, well, I don't know that that, you know, you basically will go, you can do better than that, pretty much. Do you know what I mean? But you can't. But I can't. That's the tragedy of it. And that's why often the episodes are so sad and I'm heartbroken all the time. Um, yeah. But it's something that you just had, you have that had a relationship for a very long time. So you're able to understand each other and know each other where you can make improvements for. Like mutual disrespect. <laughs> that sort of, we don't mind um, telling each other we're shit. Yeah, uh, that's healthy. I think that's always one way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, no, I suppose it's a familiarity working with each other a long time that there's no, no one's precious, I think, in our meetings. You know, so there is that sort of candid, I'm not sure that's right, and then a bitter argument, and then some some <laughs> compromise. Yeah, we usually sort of agree on things, and, 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 and generally when there's a sort of disagreement over a story point, usually I'm sort of going, but I don't know what else to do. What else should I do? Like, there'll be a point where I go, well, what do you want to happen? What do you want to have happen? I don't know. I'm fucking the cupboard's bare, mate. Um, <laughs> so sometimes that, you know, sometimes it's just, you can get so sort of stuck in a story, you can't, you can't see, and, and sometimes then the thing to do um, I've done this a couple of times with different... Maybe I did it with Hang the DJ. I did it with a couple of them where I give up. I certainly did it with Hated in the Nation as well. I gave up. I can't do it. And I went off and wrote something else. And then it, it sat in a drawer 
and then sort of came back to it and suddenly you go, oh, I'll just cut out all the shit bit. Um, and usually that's, that's what works. And you're quite good at seeing the, the bigger picture that I, get, I can get quite sort of stuck in my furrow. But that is your job as the what, writer. To get stuck in a furrow? Yeah, yeah to hold on <laughs> like and a, to be worried. Like and, a shy and horse. <laughs> <laughs> Never thought of you as a shy horse, but okay, I can okay. run with that. Uh, we have got the biggest screen I think I've ever seen in my entire life, so I thought we might as well use the opportunity to have a look at a clip. Uh, we're going to start off with uh, San Junipero, when uh, Yorkie and Kelly meet at the bar for the first time. I mean, what an episode. Were you surprised that the story resonated with the public so much? Uh, I, um, I was relieved because because it was the first it was the first one um, written for Netflix and um, it was probably our first overtly uplifting ending and so I was quite worried that people would go well I'm not having this uh, well this because I remember what, I used to be a bit like that if I'd watched a Twilight Zone and it didn't leave me with a sort of gnawing sense of dread I was like well that's not what I came for. Um, you found it unsettling. I found it a bit yeah, unsettling. Any, any happy ending is unsettling. Yeah, well, I guess it's, it's like somebody going to a dominatrix and, they, and, and, and she just makes them a cup of cocoa or something. <laughs> it's like, it's not why you're there. Um, so, you know, in that respect, it was deliberately pushing the boat out and seeing if we could um, do something like that. And, and, it, and it, was, it was interesting. I remember when we were discussing it, we thought one of the things that people might discuss was the fact that it was actually a story with, again, it's a spoiler, like elderly people and that they're, they're having sex and it's about their sex lives and their love lives and stuff. And no one ever, ever comments on that, actually, it's, which is interesting. It's a very universal story. No one ever sort of... Yeah. That never, no one ever says, well, that's quite unusual, isn't it? No one sort of says that. I think they still don't quite make the connection. It's because we don't show older people doing it. Enough. <laughs> Oh, Enough in, generally. In the show. In the show. Yeah. yeah. Well, she's not able, is she? That was the whole point. <laughs> That's why she had to go back. Keep it light. <laughs> Keep me? <laughs> Bloody hell. No, I do... One one mm. thing I do love... I mean, you're right. It's not, not really why it's loved, but I do love the fact that in that film you have two elderly women who have got a personality and a sexuality and it's totally raw and and it's not often you see that in drama so that never, was you, one, a personal you, element because you never see that in drama because I think I mean I'm, I'm gay and and I think it's something that's so well written in where it's not a central hook about them being LGBT it's kind of a subtle yeah. reference point into it it's just a normal love story oh no totally and it's about you know the, the whole point is about being able to go back to a time where these two old women suddenly felt alive again because they were in an environment and an era that they understood so you know the, they it, you know it was the 80s and they understood the music and the references and so they felt alive again and but the added bonus of course was that it was being relived in a time when all of the prejudices that would have existed at that time and now have been removed so they were to be able to live their life again which you know is a wonderful uh, simple idea are the episodes that have a happy ending, are they easier to write than ones in that are having a sad ending, or is it very much the other way around? Oh, I mean, it really, it really depends. I think it's difficult to probably, it would be, there's not that many episodes we've done with a happy ending, so it's sort of, I mean... So that answers the question, <laughs> it's very difficult. Hang the DJ has got a happy ending, and USS Callister has got a, has got a triumphant ending, I would say. Um... And so I suppose it's probably trickier. You've got to make sure that you're not it because I think a happy ending only doesn't work when you when you don't feel it's earned or you just go, oh, that's bloody typical, isn't it? <laughs> God, who cares? Um, so so whereas I guess if you've put the characters through the ringer and then they have a sort of triumph, then then that feels earned. I guess I don't know. I'm kind of feeling my way into happy endings. Uh, that sounds like a weird <laughs> phrase. Somebody says on their first trip to a massage parlor. Um, sorry, uh, and <laughs> I don't know. I think it's it's. The, the, I mean, it also, it was. We didn't want to just be the show where every ending is. It's it's always depressing because that would be really, 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 really predictable. 
Um, and I guess that sort of causes a bit of a complication in, in trying to work out the order of each episode for each series. Because when it was on Channel 4, it's like, you know, you're dropping w one by one. I think people can pace it in terms of expecting if they're going to be quite sad or quite unfortunate endings. But when you're dropping a whole series at once, there's a bit more of a concern that it's got that right sort of feeling or that right order. Was that a bit of a real challenge to go and work out which goes where? We do have debates. Yeah, mm. um, but, but I mean, that's in the development stage as well. So before the working out of the running order on Netflix, you want to, you know, you do not want to be predictable, as Charlie said. You can't, you know, if everything is, you know, bleak. I mean, Jesus Christ, who wants to watch that? That's our lives. Oh. <laughs> um, so we are aware of that uh, in the development stage. And then, um, but I mean, I think that increasingly on Netflix, people can go to the films that they are drawn to and don't necessarily have to watch them all in the same order or all of them at all. You know, that's the wonderful thing, that they can exist as single films and if people don't want to watch mm. the one about the pig, they don't have to. Or unless, yeah, although we should force them to watch that and it only unlocks the other episodes after you've watched that 97 times. Um, <laughs> that would be funny. <laughs> um, they... Uh, uh, well, they, and Netflix don't tell us like how many people have watched it. So for all we know, it could be three. Um, but they do sort of. They have told us that in between seasons four and uh, sorry three and four, um, people learnt that it was an anthology show. So when it came to the, the most recent season that went up, people were were watching them in any order they wanted. They were doing kind of what you're meant to, which is you look at the list of episodes and pick the one that appeals to you the most based on the title and the sort of little screenshot is sort of my... Re when, when people say, which one should I start with? I say, do that. I'm not fucking choosing for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Black Mirror <laughs> is a show that very much talks about, you know, our relationship with technology. But I think it's, it, it, it's not necessarily... It more or less, I think, pinpoints more about our, about how humans interact with technology or use it for a way that it might not have been intended. I always see it that the technology is not necessarily the problem. It's, it's humans using it for their own ends that might be like an unintended consequence. Do you share that point of view? Yeah, do I think we do. I mean, I, I would say yeah. that I, mean, I, get, I get sort of sulky when people characterize it as the show that's people going oh phones are bad and the internet is bad and i mean obviously we sometimes do a bit of that um like, but sometimes we're taking the piss a bit so in the end of playtest i thought it was hilarious that we literally had an episode where someone is killed by a mobile phone but no one seemed to pick up on the tongue-in-cheek black humor of that they just thought oh god look at those miserable brits um <laughs> Uh, no, I think it's it's because it would be it would be quite. We don't tend to do we don't tend to do, for instance, stories about a sinister corporation that's like pushing some technology on the population, and uh, you know we we don't tend to do that because a I don't really understand what that story is, as in it's a, it you, it's hard to get a foothold on it, it's, and it's quite boring, um, and also I don't sort of it's not as interesting I think as watching someone <laughs> mess their own life up. I thanks guess to an it's app. also yeah. the case that that. <laughs> that evil corporations don't know that they're evil themselves as well. They think they're doing something for the best of intention. Yeah, I was going to say, something like Nosedive, a film we did with Bryce Dallas Howard about, um, you know, a sort of satire about status anxiety in the modern world. You know, the technology there is slightly more... I mean, it does depend on each episode, but in Nosedive, the technology is very foregrounded because it is the, the, the device that is you know, that she's being a slave to, that is controlling her world. And so, yes, it's human weakness a lot of the time, but when you have technology that is designed to be that addictive and to buy, designed to be the drug that rewards you for the social engagement, you know, technology is playing a significant role there, and it's hard for Bryce, you know, in that scenario to resist. So I think it, it depends on each film. Speaking of segues, we might as well watch a clip of Nosedive. Uh, this is when... That's slick. That felt like the one show. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Bryce Dallas Howard here uh, as uh, Lacey is at the airport and uh, her flight's delayed and she's introduced... Well, she meets M Michaela Cole, who's fantastic. So, so good. I mean, there's one thing that I got from watching that, which is I think our relationship with social media, you know, it can be more deeper in terms of the negative effects of it than I first realized from that. I f from watching Nosedive, I think my relationship with social media has changed. From, from the show itself, do you think your relationship with social media has changed now? That I don't know. I, as in, I, the, the, the origin for, for Nosedive was, was um, it was an idea that we, 
we'd had a while back where originally it was going to be a like a Brewster's Millions story about the idea was that someone was being blackmailed into it was going to be in a reputation economy where you had you know maximum five stars and there was going to be someone who was who was being blackmailed into reducing their reputation to zero in 48 hours this was the idea it was going to be a, like a comedy movie that we wanted to do and then i realized that once he's pulled his pants down and pooed in front of a primary school in the first five minutes there's nothing else you can do apart from having him drive around to other primary schools. Um, so, because the idea was going to Sounds be... Sounds good. Uh, does that, actually. Now I put it like that, that is a season. Um, where's he going to go first. next? He's got the Ofsted list. Um, the... Uh, but and, and it was, the, the point was going to be that he becomes a he he can't because as his as his um, rating goes down he becomes a folk hero like a Charlie Sheen sort of character and blah blah blah. But we'd done the national anthem which involved the, you know, it was sort of similar territory. So so really that then we started thinking about Uber. So really the origin for that I think came more from like TripAdvisor and Uber than it did so much from social media. But it certainly it has, there's, there's parallels there in people sort of, if, if people take their, um, you know, take a sense of self-worth, it's hard not to feel wounded if somebody unfollows you or, 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 or blocks you or something like that. So, so it's certainly commenting on that. But there's probably episodes in a way, like Be Right Back is an episode which probably... Uh, says something slightly different about how we are on social media, which is more to do with how authentic you actually are when you're on there, where he, it's, it's about um, a, a character who uh, is sort of resurrected from their social media platform, effectively. Yeah. And she's very lucky. Hayley Out was really lucky in that, because he comes back and the problem is he's a bit bland and nice. And actually, if you're writing that now, he'd probably be a Pepe the Frog meme or something. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Or he'd be like, yeah. I don't know what he'd be. You're saying it's dated. You're saying I'm saying it's dated. I'm saying dated. that something that came out several years yeah. ago is dated. Yeah, I know. I'm <laughs> sharp. <remake>. Yeah. <laughs> but I find that um, be right back so fascinating because I think it it has a relationship in terms of grief and it has a relationship in terms of trying to let go from your past. Because if I'm going through my phone, mm -hmm. I'm constantly seeing memories of like things I've been in or or, or, mm -hmm. or, or, or friends I'm no longer keeping in contact with or, or exes or so forth. And then that can sometimes make me linger more in the past and blocks me for moving on and that's yeah. very apparent in Be Right Back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's one of the overriding themes of the, the piece. You know, how do you mourn and how do you grieve in the w in a world in which, you know, everything is present, everything can be omnipresent and, you know, what used to be a very contained box of, you know, photos of a old, you know, someone who died under the bed now is there facing you at every moment. So how do you move on? And yes, no, that's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's very much a, you know, a film about uh, grieving, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Although that came about because I'd just become a dad and I was like on... You were grieving. I was grieving my grieving life. Grieving your my, my, <laughs> um, and my I was And I was looking at like social media about 3 a.m. one night in between feeds and I thought, what if all these people were dead and they were just being... Everything they were saying was just being generated by an algorithm. How would I know? Also, would that be sort of comforting? Would I mind um, if I'm never going to go outdoors ever again? Um, he and, really took to parenthood. Yeah. <laughs> I did. It was a brilliant excuse to never go outside ever again. Great. Yeah. Um, so, so, and also, uh, also, that's it. Slightly adheres to another sort of. Sometimes when we're coming up with ideas, it's quite good if you could actually, in a strange way, do the same story without any technology at all. So you could to be right back, and it could be a supernatural story about somebody being resurrected from old love letters or something like that. And you could. So I think that hopefully makes the stories feel fairly timeless or it, 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 there's, there's something about it where it's not just resting on the technology and I think that hopefully means that even though that was a whole seven years ago now that that episode came out you could still watch it and not be appalled it's not like they're driving steam trains around and wearing <laughs> stovepipe hats and communicating through tapestry mm. but I do remember with Nosedive which was the first episode we put out in season three for and the first season for Netflix, we were really worried because of the way it looks and it's set in America and that people would think it was quite light and a little bit thin, you know, and because it just looks so sort of bubblegum, you know, and uh, and yet people were horrified by it. And I think, and I love that the, that the show can do that, that you take something that, you know, looks sort of picture perfect, you know, the, the big American uh, movie, and yet at its heart, people
people just can see Bryce as a slave and having no control over her life and just, uh, you know, desperately in this spiral chasing something that doesn't exist. There's also so many different episodes that I think talk about, like, public perception towards things. So, for example, Hated in the Nation is very much by trolls by Twitter, you know, and, 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 and people deciding who they want to go and uh, like and dislike or who they want to kill, be killed by a bee. Spoiler. Um, <laughs> but also with, like, the National Anthem that was about, you know, basically people being, and the media being involved in this sort of honey trap, as it were, um, that was sort of leading them thinking that, oh, it wouldn't be funny and hilarious if the Prime Minister fucks a pig, but then they're subject to it and they see it and they see how horrible it is. I mean, do you, do you sort of see that sort of social media is, is a good good thing? This is what I sort of sense from that is sort of, you know, I realise that sometimes it's, it's, it's got much more of a devastating consequence than, than I first thought, than I first think or believe. I, th I think it's like with anything, sorry, I, I think it's like with anything in that it's a powerful new tool. And so, and, and I sometimes liken social media to having, like, it's like the human race has grown a new limb, basically. And so it's sometimes very useful because it means you can hold a can down while you uh, operate a two handed can holder to open it. That's, this is, I sense this analogy is not the best. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, it's like having an extra limb, which can be very handy for some things, but equally you sometimes you can be clumsy with it because you're getting used to it. So you flail around and you knock things over. So so in, 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 in many respects, with any of these things, there's a plus and a minus. So it's What's very the can? The can, oh, forget the can. Oh, there was a terrible can. analogy. Okay. No, right. the can wasn't part of the analogy, the oh. extra limb was. Oh, okay. Yeah, I brought a I can in to try and make the analogy clearer oh. and I, ended, I fucked it up. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, there's, there's, but it's yes yeah. and no. Yes, the answer is yes and no, isn't it? I mean, boringly, in that, you know... Uh, in, you know, public shaming is, you know, a, an innocent person wrongfully named and shamed, of course, is a bad thing. Is a bad thing? Yeah, it's a bad thing. And then, you know, social media being able to take powerful Hollywood moguls into, you know, to account is a good thing if it's mobilized people that maybe were powerless to speak. So, you know, there's, there's not an easy answer. Well, one thing that did get um, a big reaction during Christmas was Bandersnatch. Segway, we're going to show a clip. Um, this is when Colin and Stefan are on LSD. Was it LSD? Was it they were on? I well, don't think we specify it, but. Okay, well, there we go. Yeah, uh, it was. Before, <laughs> and, uh, and basically, we were all subject to a choice. I mean, um, uh, tell me about the process about how Bandersnatch was like being made, because I can sense that it was such a complicated feat. Oh, Why do we look broken? <laughs> yeah. It's a piece of piss. <laughs> <laughs> they were actually on that hard. ledge, by the way. They were actually sitting. I was slightly terrifying that they were. They were. They had like a harness on, but they were sitting. They had to sort of go slightly over the edge of a balcony, so they were genuinely quite nerve racked uh, while doing that. It was. Uh, it was sort of the whole thing was quite uh, complicated. Undertaking. Yeah. yeah, in a world in which you can have infinite stories, how, you know, again, it's the skill of trying to decide which are the right ones just in the game itself. You know, you sort of, uh, how do you try and create a cohesive whole um, and how do you manage those dis and give people meaningful decisions but at the same time not take the story off in such divergent ways that it all becomes arbitrary? But I, but I remember seeing a behind-the-scenes feature of a giant map that sort of got started with, with, with the very first choice about sort of Frosties or Sugar Puffs, and then it got wider and wider and wider and wider. Were there some times where you were thinking to yourself, okay, where are we? What are we doing? Oh, totally. Every day? Yeah, yeah. It literally. I mean, it was so, it, like, I was using Twine, which is this, like, um, interactive fiction coding thing, uh, to, to, to write it, and um, I kept... It was a slightly that was a slightly lonely process where for a few weeks I think I only made sense to myself, and I'd occasionally send you emails going I don't know, really know <laughs> what this is, and I kept adding bits and it would get more and more complicated. Um, I think the thing that we did and it was incredibly what was weird was that you'd you'd have an idea, and if you added it, a you could add it because normally when you're doing a story you think well what the character what's the character going to do here and you have to make a choice and so it's as Annabelle was saying it's about simplifying it and whittling it down with this in a way it would grow sideways was the, the you'd sort of add a bit and suddenly it's like you've built a new wing of your house that you have to then furnish and 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 upholster everything and sort of paint it and let it out and I could carry on carpet it um, <laughs> and so it, get, it got more and more complex 
That, and the, the, the other thing was that we had, we realized, I think, fairly early on that one thing we wanted to do, because I'd, I'd play, I've played a lot of computer games, it will come as no surprise to, so to anyone. To you. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and also, I'd seen in the 90s, I was a, a video games journalist and I'd played some interactive movies when everyone said CD ROM was going to be the next big thing and we were all going to live in the fucking lawnmower man. Um, <laughs> and usually what would happen is they were slightly, they were disappointing because. In a, in a computer game, if you've got a character, who, the character can become inconsistent very quickly. So if you, Red Dead Redemption 2, I was playing, so the main character, he goes and has a tender conversation with his long lost love in an early scene. And I was like playing it, I thought, that's quite well done That's it for a cutscene, that's not bad. And then it, it, it gives me c control of the character again. And I turn around accidentally, uh, rode my horse into a pig, uh, and then got off for no reason and shot it. Right, and I thought, suddenly, actually, hang on a minute, now this character is a guy who <laughs> shoots at murders a pig on his ex-girlfriend's doorstep? What's, how is that going to be factored? So he's, he becomes not a character, he's just a sort of avatar. So we, we hopefully got around that by making Stefan, the main character, is separate from your decisions. So he doesn't just act on your decisions, he is actively trying to fight against them. And what that does is it, it removes him from you... So it makes him a separate character, if you see what I mean. And that's, I yeah. think, yeah. A, tr a tricky thing that, that sort of interactive stories have to do, have to find a way of bridging that little narrative gap. Were there any ideas that you just thought, because you know the, pos the possibilities are sort of endless, were there any sort of ideas that you thought, no, we just can't do, this is getting Those too Those I wanted now. to do that we couldn't do. <laughs> we uh, cut some bits out as well. Yeah. Uh, what bits did, did, did you cut out? We cut out a bit where he kills. We, the, we, there was a scene where he kills people on the doorstep. Oh, oh you, he, mean, you mean filmed and then? Cut yeah, 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 yeah. And cut there were bits we. Yeah, there, were, there was there was some scenes we had to cut out for time, mm -hmm. um, and also it was getting too complicated. I wanted to, it to unlock achievements like an Xbox does, like literally. So you, if you got a certain ending, uh, it would. I didn't. I did want it to do that. I maintain that would have been a good idea. Um, there was a, there was a central puzzle. The one thing that frustrates me there was there was originally a central puzzle that was built into it that was just confusing to people, and it's a bit annoying because what it meant was it was always designed that you'd have to see things about two or three times, and then you'd understand. Um, the meaning of a phone number. We sort of put a version of it, yeah. but a very simplified version down one path, whereas originally it was central to the whole thing. And that might have given you more of a sense of, right, I finished now. Do you know what I mean? So um, so that's probably the main thing that I think, oh, I didn't quite nail that, if that makes sense. But I'm always picking fault and yeah. things. I mean, it's interesting do, making an interactive film on a, S for, on a streaming platform because, you know... Netflix carries films and TVs. It does not yet, you know, have games. Mm. And we are introducing a film that you hope people are going to have an emotional engagement with the characters and enjoy the narrative. But we're giving this extra layer of um, you know, another storytelling tool, in a way, that this this idea of being able to make a decision. And you don't want it to feel like a gimmick. You don't want it to feel... You know who gives a shit which you know which decision I make, and so you're trying to sort of build it in so that that interactivity just gives you a richer uh, experience and that complicity that you are actively making a decision that you're forcing your protagonist to be involved in is making you more complicit and hopefully should make you feel more not hopefully should make you feel more wretched and more involved in the in the process and you know i suppose that, that what's the wanky tv term leaning in is that what it is you know not passive viewing but active viewing and you sort of you that you know it's just interesting to explore how much uh, a viewer feels mm. more complicit and whether that's enabling the story and enriching the story one of the key things we wanted, we did, was to not stop the action through the film. So, at you know, in in a clunky way, you could have had the choice point come up and everything stop, and you know, and it just cut to black or whatever, and the two choices be there. And I think you would have really disengaged and not allowed yourself to feel it like a film. So we we worked really hard, not just at simplifying the story, but the interface and making it feel all one awful experience <laughs> and it's also the case that what i find so so am amazing and mesmerizing but also baffling is when you're sort of facing the very first choice it's about breakfast cereal and i remember sort of sitting there being like oh my god fuck ah and then by the end you're like 
chop up or bury the body. And you're like, oh, okay, bury the body. Fine, so yeah, <laughs> chip, chop. Oh, well, that's how it works. You should speak it? to someone. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's interesting that we thought, we did think, because some of the decisions were slightly forced on us because of technical reasons. So originally, and, and Netflix kept tweaking things and improving them as we were going. So originally it was like, well, you can have a maximum of... You have to have at least a minute of footage before a choice point, and the choice points have to be 10 seconds long. And this, and then we were like, 10 seconds, that's an age. That's like forever. And um, uh, But when you keep the edit going, and it keeps... it. Actually, people were saying, oh, God, it feels like no time at all. As soon as you see the sort of fuse ticking down, it felt quite quick. Um, the first the first choice in there, the, the Frosties and, uh, and Sugar Puffs choice, is in there slightly taking... A, it's to teach you how to do it, but also it's slightly taking the piss out of those sort of 90s interactive films where somebody goes, do you want the blue key or the red key? And he's like literally standing there with these two boxes of cereal. That was the other thing we couldn't put in that I wanted to put in. So the, the payoff for choosing... If you chose Frosties, say, the payoff was going to be that later on when you hit dad with the ashtray and kill him, it was going to cut to a shot of Frosties getting splattered with blood. <laughs> or sugar puffs, depending on what you'd chosen. But it turns out Kellogg's aren't keen um, on there. Nor are Quaker, or whoever makes sugar puffs, are uh, and equally unkeen on having their product associated with patricide. Kicking themselves now. I know. What I loved also is just that Netflix released some of the stats for what people chose. So 60% of people chose Frosties. Um, I know! Which is, yeah. Well, of course. Uh, sugar puffs are like the little polystyrene chips you get in a packing <laughs> crate, aren't they? I know, lovely. And then there was 52.9% uh, of Brits wanted to throw tea over the computer compared to 55% of the rest of the world. So as Brits are a bit more sort of protective of wasting tea, I guess. Uh, did... <laughs> Did any of the stats surprise you? I mean, how, 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 how much did you see about what people have actually chosen? They did show us quite a lot. The worst, and I was surprised that the number of people who decided to chop the body up versus burying it, because we thought more people would choose bury. I mean, a lot of it also, it is interesting, that a lot of this was very experimental in that we, A, we were encouraged to experiment and try and do different things. Mm. Um, so it does, quite, it does quite a lot in the background as well. To, so it sort of, you know, like memorize, it knows which bits you've seen and it will show you an edited version of something. So it's tracking all sorts of things. But um, what was it? There was the chopping up was surprising one. Mm -hmm. I was surprised by the number of people who ended up going down the Netflix path rather than the, what we called the white bear path. So there's a point where you choose something to put on his monitor. And if you choose the Netflix logo, it gets very fourth wall breaking. Now, originally that was going to be held back and you wouldn't possibly see that on your first go round. I slightly wonder whether we should have withheld it. But on the other hand, more so more people went down there, I think, on the first go round. And I'm like, mm, maybe that wasn't, maybe we should have, I don't know. Yeah, but I think that's because not many people, not everyone who watched it realised that White Bear was an Easter egg. No, and, so and they thought Netflix was like the menu. Yeah. Get me out of this. Fucking, <laughs> uh, stop it. Uh, Whereas, why, I want to watch Stranger Things. <laughs> Would you use data in terms of an idea to sort of for future storylines in that way? Because it's so experimental and you're sort of subject to a lot of this information for the very first time. Is it something, or do you think it just gets in the way of the creative process? You know oh, what? Well, I was just going to say, sorry, I was just going to say, actually, I mean, like, I don't think we, it's interesting feedback to know that, that what people did and didn't do. So it, it helps you work out because you'd try and guide people towards making certain decisions. And some things were very clearly like, accept the job. I think a lot most people chose that the first time around because we queued you up to think that was the right thing to do. Um, I don't know that we would... <laughs> I was just thinking, I was just remembering how... Do you remember once I wanted, when we did playtest, that I wanted it to be able to say... I wanted playtest, which is in the first, the third season. Um, I wanted it so if it's an, if you'd watched it once, if you watched it a second time, it would be different, and it would break the fourth wall, and he would be told he was in an episode of Black Mirror. And then there was gonna. I even asked if you could do it so it could work out where someone was from their information, and it would say, "I know you're watching this in London." <laughs> Um, or Budapest, or wherever you are, because I thought that would be scary. I think, in <laughs> retrospect, it would be scary on many levels. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, but that would have been fun. I just remembered something else we cut out that I wanted to put in. There's a bit where he Love puts this. in a... Why, he, why would you do this? Because no, no, he wanted to put here's in a VHS. What, here's all know? the mistakes we cut out. No, this is a fun thing. This is a fun one. Um, he, there's a bit where he gets a VHS of a documentary and he puts it on and watches it. And I wanted it to be able to remember. We was like, oh, it would be great if, if you had an option of two tapes to put in and one of them has got a film on it and you can watch the whole film. <laughs> so we'd like license like a 90 minute film or something and he'd put it in and it would be the whole thing or you could back out at any time or you could just, we'd have shot film thin sitting there watching the whole film. I really liked the idea of that. Yeah, who doesn't want to do that for two hours? <laughs> But, but seeing that, that the whole thing was so complicated, do, do you see the sort of interactivity taking off? Because I know that there's been a Bear Grylls one. Mm -hmm. Have you have you tried that? That one's just been out? No. No, okay. Um, but there's, but I mean like... You can't, you can't kill him, apparently. Uh. So I thought, well, that's the point. <laughs> but there's, there's been loads of people saying that this is going to be the future of TV and this is how it's all going to be done. But as it's so complicated, do you, do, I mean, is that... Is it's that not the future of TV, is it? It's, it's a thing and it's fun if you, you know, if you can find a fun, interesting way of using that interactivity, but it's not the future. Well, it's not the future. It's not the future. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, an element of the future, but it's not the... Yeah, because you couldn't... A, there's that narrative problem, isn't there, where you... Yeah. And B, it's... Yeah, it's complicated, and also you just it, sometimes you want to just sit there and stare at something. <laughs> don't you? What do you see the future of TV being? It's quite, I know, quite a profound question, really, isn't it? You mean in terms of shows, or well, in terms of just in terms of maybe the shows or the technology? Do you see normal TV dying? Because I think what's so interesting, particularly with you, Charlie, is that you focus TV right from screen white when you were doing it, you know, in in the basement, and you both worked together on that. And then, and then seeing how it's been now to to Netflix and this entire new sort of global streaming giant thing. Is there a direction you see it all heading in, in which like we're all going to be? subject to kind of essentially watching these big global hits and, and, and normal TV will f fizzle out? Or is it is it a bit hard to say or hard to predict? I don't know if it's going to be... I think it will end up feeling a bit like the transition from analogue to digital in that you sort of won't really notice it's happening. It's like quite quickly, quite quickly, you don't really watch much. I certainly... I had an odd experience a couple of months ago where I was watching something on TV, like live, actual like broadcast television. I saw an advert... And I thought, oh, I haven't seen an advert in ages. Like, I just hadn't seen an advert in months because I just don't, I, I sort Is of... Is it uh, <laughs> It was because I watch everything on a catch-up service or, or you know... Um, and uh, I sort of missed it. I was like, oh, this is not... Oh, yeah, they used to have jingles and everything. Do you remember? Back in the old days, do you remember that, kids? Um, uh, I don't... I, I think they'll end up sorting everything by length actually is my <laughs> that's what I end up doing um, and you'll be able to you'll be able to customize it so you go oh god well, I'm so, it's 10 o'clock and I'm really tired and I've been dealing with the kids all day what can I what can I watch that will sedate me for 28 minutes <laughs> I think that will be a category that's the dominatrix back yeah. um, no I think you know um, <laughs> I I think there will always be the appetite for the quirky small you know comedy or the, if people want if people make good shows and people find them then whether it's you know major SVODs that are dominating the, the market they will have to make those sort of shows so I think uh, I'm not worried that there's going to that we're going to be awash with huge American series long running series I think that uh, we'll decide what we want to watch and if there's and if we all want to watch things people will make it and in terms of Black Mirror is there anything that you can say about the upcoming series at all or any detail or or anything specific no <laughs> no we can't um, we, uh, it's we, coming which there, is there's, great there's some more yes some uh, more coming they're good I, I hope we can say that well, uh, well it doesn't really count if we say that does it well it might sound arrogant that's what i'm saying okay <laughs> so I'm going to say I'm going to be arrogant and say I think they're good okay uh, and they're all different you know from things we've done before um what else can we? We can't. We can't. This is the problem. It's like it's a really difficult show to because if we if we I could I could sit here and tell you everything that happens in them. It would just be please do. It would be rubbish. It would be rubbish. It would just spoil it for you because isn't part of the fun that you don't really know what it is and then you get involved in a conversation about oh I didn't like that one. That one was good. That one was a bit bleak. What the fuck was going on in that one? <laughs> um, that's sort of half the fun. Was that a spoiler? No. no. Was it? Oh. Although that's how I think of them. Yeah. What the fuck <laughs> was going on in that one? 
Um, because of course, like with with the series, you just drop it. You don't do any big. I mean, you I mean, Bandersnatch was just without fanfare. Maybe the trailer dropped the day before it came out, and then with the previous series, you give a clue or an overall trailer, but you don't give that much warning. I mean, why why is that? Is it just because you just think, well, there's no point trailering it because that would reveal too much details? We're amateurs. <laughs> We're just a bit disorganised. It's basically um, that it's incompetence. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Laziness. We're lazy. Um, no, I think it's also, it's it is hard. It's hard to yeah. tease something, you know, that it doesn't immediately give it away. So... We try not to do very much. We quite often we would have com when we've whenever there's been trails we have conversations where we are basically the killjoys because there'll be somebody else who's, who's cutting the trail and they'll go here's the first cut of a trail and we're like yeah you can't show the bit with the you can't show I'm trying to think of a <laughs> you can't <laughs> you can't show the bit with the with the doohickey because no one's meant to know about the doohickey and basically we end up telling them to cut out all the interesting shots in the trail and they end up with like somebody staring at a, I mean they, they do a bloody good job actually considering but it's really difficult I just remembered something else <laughs> great right which is do you remember like, like this was a, this is the attention to detail you have to have to stop spoilers going out do you remember was it Hang the DJ or one of those episodes we discovered that was translated into a different then like there was in, in one of the territories it went out with a different title and the title was something like they are in a simulation <laughs> right and you're like don't do that it's like calling Seven, it's her head in the box. Um, yeah, that was really annoying. And so since then, I was like, what, what are they calling it? Uh, th so that's why we didn't let them translate Bandersnatch. Remember, the French wanted to call it La Banda Grip. Yeah, spoiler. No, I know, but... Uh, they're no, they're not, they're not allowed to do that. Okay. Mm. That's, that's a tricky one, because there's like, they... Um, there was, I mean, there's bits, but like in a weird way, Bandersnatch was because it was about someone who was slowly losing their mind while doing a, a complex problem. That was mirroring what was going on at all levels of the production. In many ways, many of the conversations, genuinely, many of the conversations that happened in Bandersnatch were playing out in our office yeah. a lot of the time. And we were all forced to play along. Yeah, all right. <laughs> um, I yeah. do find that. Uh, like weirdly, it's things like Metalhead that I find frightening, or Men Against Fire actually, which is a is a particularly chilling episode. Which uh, and the Waldo moment. There's lots of them actually. <laughs> so there's, they're often the ones that tend to be a bit more earnest, or, the, the, the ones that are probably the most personally scary to me, because I quite often worry about society collapsing and us all having to fend with sharpened sticks. Um, and my tip is, if that happens, go for the eyes. <laughs> first, because I reckon if you go for the eyes first, you debilitate someone and then you can finish them off. Um, you certainly can without breaking the show. It's like if Game of Thrones is to say it said, we're going to do an episode that's sideways um, and it's just all like this. It's all side on as though you're watching it in two dimensions sideways. Um, no one would stand for it. Um, and no one would watch it again, and no one would have a clue what was happening. Whereas we can sort of break the world, so we can do a black and white episode, or a yeah, yeah we can do an interactive episode, or what have you. So yes, I guess. Yeah, I'd still watch Game of Thrones. So I just if want it was to say. sideways. Yeah. For how long? <laughs> Two days. I could do it. I bet everyone here would. What if it was sideways? Yep. If, what's the matter with you people? Of course you wouldn't. Don't shut up. You would not watch it if it was sideways. Dragons look the same, whatever angle no, you're looking side, for. No, I mean side... I don't mean, like, on its side. I don't mean, what like, do turned counterclockwise 90 degrees. I mean, literally, sideways. So it's, like, two-dimensional. You can, you can only see a strip of light. <laughs> you can't see a dragon? No, it's a strip oh. of light. It's oh, sideways. forget that. Forget that. <laughs> when, when writing, I mean, sometimes... Um, well, Jordan Peele did say that he, he partly cast Daniel on the back of... He saw him in 15 Million Merits, and that was where he got on his radar. So that was, yeah, that was that's flattering. Um, um, I think I've noticed increasingly when writing, and this goes back slightly to San Junipero, that was probably... Being a guy, often my first default would be, like, who's the character? Oh, it's a bloke called... Oh, he's Bob. He's a bloke. And, he's just, and when I did San Junipero, I was really nervous writing this because it was uh, 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 about these two women um, and I thought I don't really know am I going to get this wrong <laughs> I don't know so all I could do was kind of write it as 
as univer you just put yourself into somebody's shoes and write what you would and that actually solves the problem because of course everyone is the same so what were you worried about you fucking idiot um, now I've noticed that sometimes it's helpful to um, to I, a tip I give writers now, which I think is probably quite useful, I don't know if this is just a patronising tip, but if you basically put in characters that are of different ethnicities and sexualities and, and backgrounds generally, and you specify that as the character name, oddly, it makes that person much more specific from the start. And it sort of means that throughout in the casting process, you set the sort of things in stone. So, so you probably are, hopefully creating a more diverse show and not in a sort of wanky box ticking aren't I fucking clever look at me sort of way but in a way that hopefully makes it less boring um, and means you're having to think a bit more about all the characters so um, sometimes when you're writing you sort of picture a person you've seen in something else and sometimes that's the other thing it helps solidify that but they become it becomes a less generic person in your head um, so sometimes you sort of picture somebody sometimes you picture an actual established actor because that helps and you get their speech rhythms and stuff like that more often than not you sort of picture a vague composite of somebody that's probably been dredged up by an algorithm in your head we've all got one of them <laughs> but um you know it's all about how the actor responds to the script and the material as well and sometimes you, you know often you have our casting director Gina Jay gets in loads of amazing actors and the read you'd be surprised how different the reads can be for a scene and then you know instinctively whether someone's totally understood the character and um and and it, you know we're very lucky that we always go with the, the person who's understood the material the most well and that's a good point is actually sometimes you see when you see uh, like an audition from somebody sometimes it's like oh wow that is the character as written they've stepped off the page blah 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 sometimes it's not at all what you pictured but what they're doing is more interesting or is better and so that those two things can happen 